My name is uh, Torur, but uh, I tell people to call me Tor because almost nobody can pronounce my name outside <laughs> of the Faroe Islands where I'm from. Um, I'm a student here, um, Innovation Entrepreneurship uh, International, and I'm supposed to interview Bill. I was supposed to go second, but uh, Morten from the Danish got a flu. Uh, so I'll just start. Where, where are the Faroe Islands? It's uh, right between Iceland and Scotland. Oh, wow, yeah, yeah. Never heard about them? No, I've, I've heard about them. I didn't know where they were. <laughs> okay. They're here. Yeah, it's a very small, 50,000 people. It's part of the Danish kingdom. Wow. So I'm kind of Danish. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Iceland used to be part of Denmark, too, didn't it? Yeah, until the late 1800s. Now yeah. the Danish kingdom is uh, Denmark, the Faroe Islands, and Greenland. Yeah. Great. All right. Um, Earlier said you were a family man when you first you, when you started your first business. In Denmark, people pride themselves on having this healthy work-life balance. Mm -hmm. Can you maintain this work-life balance and still be an effective entrepreneur? Uh, yes, absolutely. And I, I, I think some people think you know it's about the number of hours you work. Work-life balance is about being happy. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, if you're if you're in a job for eight hours a day and you're not happy. I don't see how you have work-life balance. You're going to go home and you're going to, that's not work-life balance at all. Um, so uh, if you're in a startup, there's some times where you're going to have to work very, very hard. But, you know, it's not really work. You get very excited about it. And so um, I have four kids and they saw me growing up very passionate about things. So, but when you're, a start, when you're in a startup, there, there's a lot of, um, you know, um, mothers in the United States who like to be entrepreneurs because they can control their own time. <coughs> There's a, um, there's a saying by a famous basketball coach. He said, never confuse activity with achievement. Never confuse activity with achievement. Just because someone's at the office until, you know, 5 o'clock doesn't mean they're doing th productive things. <laughs> they're just at the office until 5 o'clock. So I think the beautiful thing about entrepreneurship in today's world, especially with technology, is it's about getting things done. And you can get that done in different places at different times. So I think entrepreneurship offers you more flexibility to have better work-life balance. Oh yeah, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> um, now, you said, uh, now you have reached a point uh, where you are in control of your own destiny. Have you ever heard of the Nordic concept, uh, the law of Janta? Uh, I may have, what is it? Who here has heard of the law of Janta? <laughs> Yeah, Jantlon, Jantlon. <laughs> okay, now okay. it's it's a famous uh, Nordic concept. It's mostly used ironically. It's really yeah. taken seriously. It's from an old novel from uh, a town called Jante, where people implemented uh, ten laws to protect the citizens. And the, lo the laws uh, go something like go like this: Arodenda, you should not think you are anything special. You're not as good as we are. You're not smarter than we are. Never imagine you're so better than we are. Uh, you think, never think you know, uh, know as much as we do. Uh, never think you're more important to us. Uh, never think you're, you never think you're good at ev anything. And never laugh at us. Um, and never think, about, never think that anyone cares about you. <laughs> as it's mostly used ironically. That's very depressing. It is. <laughs> but there is, there is still a tendency in the Nordic culture to have a net negative attitude towards people who want to stand out. Uh, uh, definitely more than in the States, I would believe. Yes. Uh, it's more focused on the collective than yeah. the individual. So how can uh, Danish students who want to stand out overcome the opinion of others so they can uh, also become in control of their own destiny? Well, I think there's there's... There's a misperception of some of that. I mean, entrepreneurs are willing to be different. Yeah. Um, that if, if, as I say, if all the fish are swimming this way, you're willing to swim the other way. You're willing to be different. Um, that is one thing. Other, the other aspect of this is where you become a narcissist. You become kind of, I'm the most important thing. And, and um, I think entrepreneurs who take themselves too seriously are not very effective. You know, and, and to me, that's the part of it. I always said, I take our mission very seriously at the company, but I don't take myself too seriously 
because if you think it's all about you, you're not going to you're not going to be you know, you're not going to be successful because you have in entrepreneurship, you have to get other people to work with you. You have to get other people to want to work with you. This idea that entrepreneurship is an individual sport is just not true. The data shows that and you could just think about it. The data shows that more people on your team, the more likely you are to be successful. And, and just think, if you're Steve Jobs, you can't do anything by yourself. You have to get other people to believe in it with you. So you have to get other people. Um, and the other part of it is if you take yourself too seriously and you think you're too important, then it's hard to fail. Like, you have to be able to laugh at yourself when you're an entrepreneur. And then that doesn't mean you, don't, you, you can't take yourself very seriously because you have to laugh at yourself, say, hey, I wasn't right. What, you know, but, but you never take the, the, the mission, let, um, you, you don't take the mission as a joke. The mission is a very serious thing. And uh, when you're talking about, you know, making the customers happy in the two things you've seen here, that's the mission. How we do it down here, it's not about us, it's about the mission. And so I think that's the, that's the part of it that's true, um, that you can't take yourself too seriously, you have to be humble, you always have to be learning um, in the process. But um, you have to be willing to be different. You can't just go along. I mean, that's the essence of an entrepreneur. It doesn't do the same thing that everyone's been doing before. All right. I, I think that's also part. Of, I, I don't. I think Scandina Scandinavians and, and Danes are. They're very. They're, they're interested in style. They're interested in design. That by nature is creative. That's be, being different. So I wouldn't buy. I, I think Scandinavians are every ability to be entrepreneurial. Um, you also said um, in Denmark we have we are more comfortable, yes, because of the Danish welfare society, yes. But um, that might uh, cause a lot of resistance, especially um, if you're a student from your parents. They yeah. might ask, why on earth would you take this risk? Yeah, when uh, you're probably gonna get a good job when you're done and uh, with all the social benefits. Why would you take the risk and go your own way? Yeah. Um, the, have, to, have you any advice for how to deal with resistance from parents if you get the idea you want to follow? Well, being a parent and being a grandparent, I would say you should always listen to your parents. <laughs> uh, look, if this has been true forever. I mean, I, my parents told me to do things that weren't, what, you know, they didn't understand. The world's changing very rapidly. You know, um, uh, your parents are going to love you, you know, it's not about, you know, you're not a trophy for them. They want you to be happy. They want you to be successful. The world's changed. When I grew up, you worked at IBM, you had a job for life. That's not true anymore. There's no jobs for life anymore. So I think you just go explain to your parents. There was one interesting one. We had, um, we had I have a student named Kim Gordon. She started a company called Depict. And her parents were very, you know, she was the oldest daughter and they were very high strung. And she kept saying, will you talk to my parents, you know? Um, I said, why? She goes, because they think I'm not doing anything useful here. Um, and when I went to them and I told them, I said, look, you know, uh, I teach at MIT and this is serious. This isn't like Kim is a, is a great student. Um, they were very, very happy. They just, you know, I think they just wanted to know that they're, their daughter wasn't sitting in a room playing video games. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and, uh, but, the, but, but the older generation does not understand entrepreneurship. They don't understand how rapidly the world's changing. Do you try to explain to your parents Snapchat? Or, is it, are you successful? Yes. <laughs> how many of you are successful explaining Snapchat to your parents? It takes time, but it can be done. How many of you are not successful? Yeah. Wow, your parents are more understanding. <laughs> I mean, I learn from my students about Twitter and Snapchat, and I try to explain to my friends, and they just don't want to know about it. They're like, no, that's stupid. <laughs> Why can't they write letters? <laughs> um, I, I think there's, there's constantly been this generational change. But, you know, you know what you have to do. You know what will make you happy. You know, my parents didn't want us to listen to rock and roll. That was the devil's that was the devil's tongue, rock and roll, um, quote unquote. Uh, but <laughs> so, I you know you got You got to you got to make your own decisions. You got to be happy. I think there is a challenge in 
in Denmark and Scandinavia where it's, you're so comfortable. Like if you go to my classes, you will see that most of the people who take the classes are immigrants. And they're not people, you know, they're not white male Americans. Because it's so much work for them that they like go do something else where they have an advantage. And uh, it's the immigrants who are, who are creating the jobs in America. And, um, and that's what's crazy about what's going on in the United States right now and this whole immigration thing. Like immigrants are bad, are you kidding me? They're the ones who create the jobs, they're the ones who create the companies. But that's a whole other thing. Um, and we have this saying on my wall, it says, hungry dogs hunt best. You have to want to be an entrepreneur. If you don't want to be an entrepreneur, there's nothing we can do to teach you to be an entrepreneur. You have to want to do it. It's like my kids, I wanted them to be basketball players. I could have taken them to the greatest basketball schools and done everything for them. They didn't want to be, so they weren't going to be basketball <laughs> players. Two of them later regretted it, uh, but, <laughs> but the, you know, there's old saying, the bird sings from within. You have to want to do it, and sometimes comfort is a really bad thing. <coughs> Eleanor Roosevelt said, said do, do something every day that makes you uncomfortable. Being in your comfort zone all the time is not a good thing. Totally agree. <laughs> um, yeah. We keep seeing this uh, the innovative uh, new uh, business models uh, have changed the world a lot in yeah. the last years. Mm -hmm. Can you uh, tell us how you think business models will look in the future? Yeah. So right now you're seeing changing in business models. You used to buy things and that was it. And then you owned them and then you got rid of them. Um, now even today they're, they're talking about movie theaters having, you know, a monthly subscription where you can see as many movies as you want for a set price. You know, is that going to come? I think that'll probably come. It's kind of like the Netflix model moves to the physical space. What you're going to see more and more so is, is, is models where it's about the data. It's, as opposed to owning physical assets, you don't own physical assets anymore. I don't know how many of you have cars, but when I grew up, the biggest thing was to get a car, to like drive a car. You know, my kids, they don't want cars. They like want to live in where they don't have to do that. They're going to have Uber. You're going to have autonomous cars. So owning things is not the goal anymore. Owning hard assets, it's, it's sharing assets. And once you start sharing assets, all of a sudden what becomes, whether you want it or not, data becomes the play. Your privacy is going to be compromised <laughs> once you're sharing things because you're going to want to know that they know who they are and they know what you're using. So the big business models going forward are going to have a lot to do with the data involved and who owns that data and who gets to use that data and who gets to monetize that data. So that will be a huge area and we're only starting to understand the, the, the ramifications of that. I believe next year there will be, this year, there was more data that was produced um, than the entire mankind for every year before this. With our Fitbits, our phones, and everything else, we produce more data. And next year it will be more next year than not only this year, but everything that came before. <laughs> so the amount of data that's being collected is really it, and the, the ability to be data scientists. Um, are any of you data scientists here? Well, I, I would find someone who's a friend that's a data scientist and become very good friends with them. <laughs> because those people are going to be the future, and that's where you're going to see monetization become very, very interesting. 